Well, hello and welcome to our service of worship this morning. Welcome to St. James's Church here in Rowledge. And it's great that you're joining us online from your own homes or wherever you are watching or listening to this service. A very warm welcome to you. Let's just be still for a few moments before we start our act of worship. Father God, we come before you at the beginning of this new week. We draw close to you and ask that you would draw close to us, that we might know again your love for us and your presence with us. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that we might live and work to please and honour you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. And so we're going to start our act of worship in song as we sing our first hymn. set of our act of worship today we offer to God those things for which we ask for his forgiveness let us return to the Lord our God and say to him almighty God we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed through negligence through weakness through our own deliberate fault we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your son Jesus Christ who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
and we proclaim God's goodness through the words of the Gloria. collect the special prayer for today. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called to your service, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit and make us worthy of our calling. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we turn now to our Bible reading. Today's reading is taken from Colossians 2, verses 6 to 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let's pray as we come to this passage from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Father God, we pray that you would open up your word to us now. We pray that you would reveal something new and exciting to us. We ask, Lord, that we would be transformed by your living word. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, just a little bit of context, really, as we start uh, off this passage from Colossians chapter two. And I would encourage you, if you've got a Bible in front of you or if you've got it on your phone, um, just to have Colossians chapter two open um, and to just perhaps to look back as well into Colossians chapter one as we look at the context of this passage. The author of the letter uh, to the Colossians is Paul. We know this because verse one of chapter one says this letter is from Paul. So that's a fairly good clue, isn't it? An apostle of Christ Jesus. And what is his purpose of writing to the church in Colossae? Well, he's writing to this church, which he possibly never even visited. He's writing from prison in Rome. And it seems that his purpose of writing is to remind them of what Christ has done for them and to assure them that Christ is all that they need. And if you flick back in your Bibles or scroll back on your phone to chapter one, Paul says that he sets out these various incredible statements, huge uh, doctrinal statements for the global church. Paul says in chapter one, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When we look at Jesus, we see God. In Jesus, all things in heaven and on earth were created. And we read that in John chapter one as well, don't we? In him, all that was made, all that has been made was made through him. He says, Paul says uh, um, in chapter one of Colossians, in Jesus, all things hold together. There's something about being in Christ that holds everything together. Jesus is the head of the church not uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Pope, not the Queen, but Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to overcome the grave and those who follow after him have that confidence as well. We read that in Jesus the fullness of God dwells and we'll come back to that in a moment. And through Jesus and his death on the cross all things have been reconciled to God. Some amazing statements there in chapter one. And Paul is writing to uh, the church in Colossae to remind them of these facts. He's saying that Jesus is enough. And I think he would say that for us as well today. Jesus is enough for us. But the Colossians were trying to bring in other teaching from uh, paganism to Judaism to Greek philosophies and they were diluting the gospel, if you like, diluting the gospel and denying Christ as God and saviour. And so Paul says in chapter two and verse four, I am saying these words so that no one may deceive you, so that no one might trick you or lead you astray. And we can find ourselves doing the same thing, I think, can't we? We can be deceived, we can be deceived into thinking that Christ is not enough for us and especially in these really difficult times when actually everything else has been stripped away as well and we can find ourselves thinking I think God's abandoned me is Christ's redeeming work on the cross really enough for me is his love really enough and so instead of drawing closer to God through Christ we might try other support mechanisms Perhaps we turn to a bit of online retail therapy or uh, a few too many glasses of wine or we become fixated on fitness and of course nothing wrong with being fit but when we think that that's going to answer all of our all of our greatest needs then we're sadly mistaken maybe we might mix a bit of zen buddhism or something like that with our christianity perhaps we read our horoscopes assuming that they will enlighten us and into that kind of confusion, Paul writes, as you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord, continue to live your lives in him, verse six. For many of you listening to this, you know that you have received Christ as your Lord. But how easy it is to forget that all that Christ wants to do in and through us is a continual process. And we'll think again about that in a moment. Being saved is both a, a one-off event, but it's also an ongoing transformation. But this phrase, living in Christ, being in Christ, always struck me as a very strange expression. 
we use it in our communion liturgy but week by week we'll say it in a little while when we say you embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you in Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us it's a very strange expression isn't it so let's look just for a moment at what it means to be in Christ and the implications for us of being in Christ how might we understand that expression after we have received him Paul says we should continue to live in him what does it mean to be in Christ how can one person be in another person well it seems to me that there are only really three instances in which we might talk about one person being in another person and the first of those is in sexual intimacy when one person is within another person but we might also talk about a, a child being within its mother's womb or we might think about a doctor or a surgeon performing surgery inside someone else and perhaps those three pictures are helpful at describing what it means to be in Christ to be in Christ is a deeply intimate relationship the likeness of which we only glimpse in human sexual intimacy to be in Christ is a place of reliance like a, a baby relying on its mother of being fed and nurtured by by the parent like an infant with its mother before it's born and to be in Christ is a place of healing and restoration akin to a surgeon performing a healing work within the human body I wonder if those pictures of intimacy and nurture and healing describe your own current experience of your daily walk with Christ if they don't and they may not we can go to the Lord in prayer and we can say quite honestly but also very expectantly this is what I want this is what I need from you today Lord this is what you've promised me and this is what I want and I'm open to receiving this gift from you today to be in Christ to be intimate with Christ to be uh, uh, nurtured to be uh, healed through being in Christ so some pictures of what it might mean to be in Christ and then next Paul tells the Colossians of the importance of remaining in Christ you see he's addressing here a very important theological question is being a Christian is being a follower of Christ about making a one-off commitment to Jesus a once-in-a-lifetime decision to submit ourselves to Christ and then that's it nothing further required some might say all you need to do is be baptized a one-off event some might say all you need to do is is say a prayer of salvation and then that's it but those who originally followed Jesus were seen as radically different in the world their lives looked so completely unlike those around them that people were worried about them taking over they shared all that they had they sold possessions and they gave to the poor they supported widows and orphans they prayed and they saw and expected miracles for them their being in Christ was a totally new way of existing every day it meant drawing on the strength of the Holy Spirit to live out their discipleship and Paul is reminding the Colossians that being in Christ is an ongoing process so yes very definitely being a follower of, of Christ requires something of us it requires us to invite Christ into our lives to make some form of commitment to him but discipleship is an ongoing journey where we continue to be fed we continue to grow we continue to be transformed Paul uses the expression of being rooted and built up in Christ like a tree planted by a riverbed putting down deep roots into Christ drawing from his living water and being strengthened through him 
This, this is, to me, describes a place of security and stability, but also utter dependence on God. Notice he calls them to be rooted and built up in their faith in Christ, not their faith in the church. This is not about their faith in other believers or in church leaders. This is about being rooted in Christ. In verse 8 comes this warning again about not being taken captive by philosophies and empty deceits which focus on our limited understanding of the world rather than on what's possible through Christ. And then comes for the, for the Colossians and a reminder for us as well of all that Christ has achieved for us. Verse 9, in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity, the fullness of God, dwells in a human body and we too come to fullness in him. So when we're in Christ, we are in Christ with the fullness of God. That, that to me is mind-blowing. And then Paul lists what has happened, what happens to us when we're in Christ. First he says that in Christ we have a spiritual circumcision, whereas for Jews physical circumcision of male boys was about their identity as sons of Abraham. So for Christians, spiritual circumcision is about males and females being sons and daughters of God, being co-heirs with Christ, being identified with Christ. The innate sinfulness of our humanness has been removed, has been cut away, has been disposed of. Secondly, Paul says that in baptism, we're buried to an old way of life, drowned, if you like, and then raised to a new life through faith in Christ. So our sinfulness is cut away and we're raised to new life, a life that's everlasting. Our old way of life with all that stood against us, because we know that there are God-given laws and we know that we can't live up to those laws. We know that try as hard as we might, we fail. All of that old life, Paul says, using dramatic language, has been nailed to the cross. He has disarmed the power of sin over us and he has triumphed over them. One translation that I read of this particular passage says that he has trampled them into the dirt. I love that. So what? So what does all this mean? What does all this mean for us? It means that we're free to enjoy the grace of God and we're going to be thinking a lot more about the grace of God over the coming weeks. It's undeserved. It can't be earned. We all struggle to comprehend the grace of God. And Jesus himself said to his own executioners, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. If Jesus would offer that forgiveness and grace to those that wish him harm, isn't it incredible that he offers the same grace and forgiveness to us as well? This is what it means to be in Christ. It is to know new strength, to find a new source of strength in God, to have a sure and certain hope, to no longer be defined by our failures, to be assured of the hope of eternal life and to know the forgiveness and everlasting love of God. So today I pray that if you've never done so, that you might invite Christ into your life so that you might know that he is in you and that you are in him. And for those of us who have invited Christ into our lives, I pray that we would become more and more rooted in Christ's love for us. That requires something of us. That requires a dedication to set aside some time to be with God, to be nurtured by him. It doesn't need to be lots of time. It could be something as simple as five minutes in the car or five minutes while you're shaving or five minutes while you're waiting for the kettle to boil. But we need to draw close to Christ so that we can be rooted and built up in him. So let me pray for each of us today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the amazing truths of this passage. We thank you that you want to continue to build us up, 
Thank you that our salvation is a one-off event. We can invite you into our lives and you will remain in us forever. But thank you as well, Lord, that you don't just want to leave us the way we are. You continue to change us, to shape us, to transform us. Lord, would you help us to draw close to you, knowing that as we do so, we will find you there, waiting to throw your arms of love around us again. We ask all of this in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. And as we reflect on those words today, let us declare our faith in God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so let us pray together for the needs of the world, for our own needs and for the Church of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you are the Christ of all our moments. Be present now as we stop and pause on our journey through today. Heavenly Father, you are the grace of all our moments. Hold us well as we stop and breathe slowly on our journey through today. And while Spirit, you are God's power in all our moments, blow in us and blow us in the right direction as we resume our journey through today. And blessed are you, Lord God, King of every horizon, whose holy presence waits for us to catch up with where you are. Walk on our stormy seas, so we invite you into our little boat. Stand at our crossroads, so you show us new directions. Sit with us at our tables, so we eat and drink of your heart. And always walk ahead of us, so that we see clearly the way you want us to go. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the provisions that are being made by caring people in this time of lockdown. Thank you for the progress being made on vaccines and the rollout of that program, making it a safer place to live. We thank you for all the health staff in our hospitals and care homes, for the considerations and sacrifices they have made to keep their patients safe and to care for them above and beyond the call of duty. As we celebrate all these demonstrations of care and good work, we nonetheless pray that you will destroy COVID-19 and remove it from the face of the earth so that we can once more go about in peace and concord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And I would give you this opportunity just to reflect 
who is on your heart today that you would long to see God touch, to bring either his healing presence, his helping heart, his caring and protecting spirit. Who is it that's uppermost on your heart? Just in a moment of silence, let the Spirit of God bring to our awareness who we care for specifically just now. And when you know, just say out loud the Christian name as your way of saying, Lord, meet this person at their point of need. Let's do that now. Josh and Jody. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we give you thanks for St. James's Rowledge and its 150 years of witness and fellowship. Inspire us in our day to be as big a risk taker as the pioneers of our church were 150 years ago. Whilst we give thanks for what's behind us, let us not build our camp there, but build it, Lord, where you guide us now. So will you inspire Russ, our rector, and the PCC, and all those in leadership, Adele in her work with young people, and Beth in hers too. And all of us, as we come together as a faith family, will you so sharpen us to know what you're saying is your calling upon us? as a church for now and the days that lie ahead. Give us a holy boldness to grasp the challenges and give us a quiet stillness to hear your guiding voice so that we make good choices. Lord, in the words of Jesus Christ, build your church, build our church to the glory of God and the good of other people. I love this prayer from St. Teresa of Avila. Let's make this our prayer as we face the challenges of today as well as those of tomorrow. She wrote, trust in God. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things pass. God never changes. Patience achieves all it strives for. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. God the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, pour out his Holy Spirit on us all as we bring our prayers to his throne and he brings his heart to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we prepare bread and wine in our own homes and here in church, we continue our worship of God as we sing our next hymn.
And so we pray over the bread and the wine and give thanks for all that God has given to us. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to you, our heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, in accordance to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may we be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, in remembrance of the precious death and passion, the mighty resurrection and glorious ascension of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, we offer you through him this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service that we owe. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences, and fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread 
to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. And so wherever you are today, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he has given for you, and his blood, which he has shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table, but you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. And so, having received this simple and yet profound meal, we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And so as we come to the end of our act of worship this morning, we close with our final hymn.
Thank you so much for joining us for our service online today and we pray that you would know God's blessing in the week to come. Let me pray that blessing over you, over your families and over your homes this week. May we know the peace of God, the peace of God which passes all understanding. And may that peace keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and with those whom you love now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.